Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. So, today we will start this uh, first lecture on mathematics in modern India. There will be two lectures covering the modern period roughly from 1750 to the present time. As you can see, it is a long period and lot of historical records and lot of events have happened. So, we will have to focus on important themes uh, in this uh, period. So, I will first say something about the uh, way that the indigenous uh, tradition in astronomy and mathematics continued late into 19th century. We will tell you something about the nature of uh, indigenous education system in India in early part of 19th century before the British started the English education system here and how that system survived of course, very limpingly till the later part of 19th century. Then I will say something about the modern European scholarship on uh, the Indian tradition of astronomy and mathematics during the two centuries 18th and 19th centuries and then how Indians themselves participated in this uh, rediscovery of tradition in the later part of 19th century. Then of course, this new system of education that was started uh, in the middle of 19th century, how did that develop. But the main part of today's lecture will look into the life and work of Srinivas Ramanujan and its impact today. <coughs> so, till about 50 years ago, most modern scholars, most textbooks said Indian mathematics died with the Bhaskaracharya, the two around 1150. Later, people only wrote a few commentaries, a few works here and there. As we have seen in detail in this course, uh, very interesting work was done in the post Bhaskara period. We have discussed Narayana Pandita, we have discussed the Kerala scholars Madhava, Parmeshwara, Nilakantha, and we have given you some inkling of the work of uh, Krishna Daivagya, Ganesh Daivagya, and even this trigonometrical work of Kamalakara. We have, of course, not discussed the uh, astronomical efforts of Savai Jai Singh of uh, Jaipur. Now, in about 1800, uh, in the 18th century, there were many European observers who came to uh, interact with the traditional Indian astronomers and mathematicians. And uh, here is one such, Lee Gentry was deputed to observe the transit of Venus uh, in Southeast Asia and he went to Pondicherry, which was a French enclave. And he got uh, an eclipse in 1765, computed by a native astronomer as they call and compared it with the best tables that they had. And what Gentil found was that uh, the Indian calculation was 40 seconds too short for the duration of the eclipse. The Tobias Mayer's table gave 1 minute 8 seconds too long, this in 1765. For the totality, the, the Tamil method was 7 minutes 48 seconds too short, Mayer's tables were 25 seconds too long. And uh, Lee Gentil said that this was even more amazing because this Tamil astronomer was computing with cowrie shells with no tables on hand on basis of memorized tables. They did their astronomical calculations with swiftness and remarkable ease without pen and pencil. Their only accessories were cowries that is the shells. This method of kavadai as they call in Canada. This method of calculation appears to be to be more advantageous in that it is faster and more expeditious than ours. Nagebayar who is calling all this Tamil method and all that is actually referring to what is called the Vakya method of calculation, which was prevalent in most of South India, especially developed by the Kerala astronomers. Nagibai's account from which I have drawn the above quotation also talks of John Warren's book, where he is talking of again in Pondicherry an eclipse being observed in 1825 and the error is about 23 minutes of their calculation. What I was saying is that the traditional methods of calculation were fairly efficient and continue late into 1810 early 19th century and the results were reasonably comparable with whatever was available from the best available tables of contemporary astronomy. Two important astronomers, Shankara Varman in early part of 19th century, he wrote Sadratnamala. It is a Karada text in astronomy, 
based on the Parahita system. He also wrote his own Malayalam commentary. There is a some interesting discussion of square roots and cube roots. Chapter 4 deals with signs and Shankar Varman also gives this uh, value of pi to 17 places that I mentioned. Another important uh, astronomer who continued the indigenous tradition was Chandrasekhar Samanta in Orissa called Pathani Samanta. He wanted to improve the Panjanga of the Puri temple and he wrote uh, this massive work Siddhanta Darpana. He was all traditionally trained and was not trained in modern uh, education system 1869. Based on his own observations, he improved the parameters of traditional works. He detected and included all the three major inequalities of lunar motion and he also improved the traditional estimates of earth's and distance. And in chapter 5, Samantha presented a planetary model in which the five planets go around the sun which goes around the earth something like Nilakantha's planetary model which is called the Tychonic uh, model or based upon the name of Tycho Brahe. So, there were sort of important astronomers and mathematicians in 19th century, but uh, as Mahatma Gandhi declared in 1931 that there was a great de-education of India which occurred in 19th century. That Mahatma Gandhi in a famous speech when he goes for the round table conference in London, he is making a statement that today that it was in 1931, India is more illiterate than it was 50 or 100 years ago and so is Burma. And that is because the British administrators came and disrupted the indigenous system of education which he calls as the, the beautiful tree died because they dug up the roots and left the roots exposed. So, what is this indige indigenous education system in the earlier part of 19th century? So, most observers who visited or administrators who stayed in India uh, reported that uh, almost every village here had a school. So, here is Thomas Munro declaring 1813 that schools established in every village for teaching, reading, writing and arithmetic or here is a dispatch from the British government in London to Bengal, where they are noting that the instruction of the people here is provided for by a certain charge upon the produce of the soil and other endowments in favor of the village teachers who are thereby rendered public servants of the community, something which can hardly be said today uh, that uh, no government servants they receive their pay either from Delhi or from Fort St. George and they are not servants of any community. Uh, in 1819, uh, Bombay, it was said that there are probably as great a proportion of persons in India who can read, write and keep simple accounts as are to be found in European countries. So, this is the kind of accounts that administrators and observers were talking about an education system about which the Britishers had nothing to do. They had not started their education system and they were not providing any money for what was there and this was sort of maintained at the societal level, perhaps at a much more sort of uh, uh, the decadent state than it would have been when the state indeed actively promoted it and supported it in earlier periods. So, to look at this system, various surveys were conducted in the end of first part of uh, 19th century. The survey in Madras presidency went through all the districts in detail and it found in 1825 that there were 11,575 schools and 1094 colleges in Madras presidency, which includes coastal Andhra, whole of Tamil Nadu. Northern uh, Kerala and the Ganjam district of uh, Orissa and the Bellari district of Karnataka. And Thomas Munro concluded that something like one third of the boys of school going age are being educated under this system. The data showed something around one fourth. Thomas Munro said a large number are being educated privately at home also. But what was significant about this uh, survey was that uh, about 50 percent of the students belong to what is called the Shudra community, 15 percent of the students belong to what are called the other castes whom we refer to as the scheduled castes and scheduled types today. So, the majority of the students 65 percent came from the non dvija category of Indian society. If you look at the num percentage of children of uh, school going age of each community being educated, you find that 16 percent, six, nearly 17 percent of the boys of school going age of Shudra community were receiving education in this public education system in these schools. In Tamil speaking area in Tamil Nadu it was something like 23 percent and 17 percent in Tamil Nadu of uh, 
children of school going engage in the other communities that scheduled castes and scheduled tribes were receiving education in it. No wonder Mahatma Gandhi called it the beautiful tree. The languages of instruction were regional languages. The colleges that they are talking 1094 were of course, the higher learning was in Sanskrit and various subjects were taught. In Kerala, it was interesting that there were 800 students privately studying astronomy and about 154 studying medicine and a majority of them were uh, non-dvijas. And here is a statement from the collector Bellari, which says that we are not supporting the system of education even a bit. Of course, it was being supported during the earlier indigenous governments. A similar survey was done in Bengal by William Adam uh, and he found a large number of schools and colleges, but the interesting thing is the kind of subjects that were taught in these colleges. Vyakarana was taught in 1424 uh, uh, institutions of learning, Nyaya in 378, Dharma Shastra in 336, Kavya in 120, Purana in 82, Jyotisha in 48 and then Kosha, Alankara, Vaidya, Veda, Tantra, Mimamsa, all Shastras were studied, but the proportion of students learning Vyakarana and Nyaya and Dharma Shastra was very large. And another thing Adam found in his survey was that the books that these uh, people were studying in these colleges, the instruction went to 10 to 25 years, were the most advanced texts that were written by famous uh, savants in 17th century or 18th century, works of Nagesha Bhatta, Gadadhara, Jagadisha, Kaunda Bhatta. So, all these were the works that were being studied in these colleges. And especially in Navadvip, uh, everybody uh, said that there is a huge university. Navadvip is the home of uh, Navyanya, it is uh, the place where Chaitanya also was there. Uh, it is said that in 1700, they were at Navadvip about 4000 students and around 1000 teachers. And in 1790s, about 1100 students and 150 teachers. And in 1829, there were 25 colleges with 500 to 600 students. This was the status of Navadvip. So, this was the state of indigenous education system when these surveys were made. Uh, but soon enough, the British policy was to discourage all this education, at least not provide them any support from the state system and whatever support that the state system was to give was for the new system of education that they wanted to start, mainly based upon English language and English literature. So, in this new system, in 18, 18, 1855, there were only 83 schools in it in Madras presidency. By 1870, about 3000 schools had been brought under the aid scheme. It was only in the decade of 1870 to 1880, about 10,000 of the indigenous schools were brought under the aided scheme. So, the indigenous schools, those 11, 12,000 had continued almost till 1880 without any state support. So, only around 1880, the number of students studying under the government, uh, governmental department of education started becoming comparable to the students in the indigenous schools 50 years earlier. Okay. So, we will close this. Let us say something about, uh, there are many slides on the uh, various ways in which modern scholars and our own people uh, started knowing about Indian astronomy and mathematics. There are lot of names and lots of names of texts. I put them down all for uh, completeness sake, so that you can really read it and get an idea of the kind of work that went on in. So, I will not be going through these slides in detail in the lecture, because it will be laborious to merely recounting the names, but most students do need to know the great scholars who worked on our uh, uh, indigenous uh, tradition of uh, mathematics and astronomy. So, earliest of course, goes back to Lalouvre, uh, who wrote from Siam about uh, Indian magic squares and uh, Indian methods of planetary tables. Lee Gentile, I have already mentioned. Based upon the French reports and the manuscripts, a treatise on Indian astronomy was written by Bailey in French and it was reviewed by John Playfair, an important professor in Edinburgh in 1790s. But of course, in India by then this Asiatic society was founded and the journal Asiatic researchers started reporting uh, from modern scholars reports on nature of Indian science, mainly William Jones, Davis, John Bentley, etcetera were the amongst the important people. 
but it was uh, some books started getting translated in early part of 19th century. Bijaganita was translated from the Persian version by Edward Strachey, but soon enough Henry Thomas Colebrook translated the Bijaganita and Lilavati of uh, Bhaskara and also the mathematics chapters of Brahmasputta Siddhanta. Colebrook was also an important scholar of law, linguistics, philosophy, etc. John Warren discussed the planetary methods of, compute, methods of computation based on the Vakya system uh, in 1825. Uh, this book contains an interesting discussion uh, between B. Hain, Charles Bish and John Warren on the knowledge of various South Indian uh, pundits, the knowledge of the infinite series and mathematics like that amongst them. Of course, one group believes that this is all borrowed from the West and they are just lying as bluffing as they, they must have looked up some modern books, modern calculus books. Other group believes, no, 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 this is all, there are, these are found in Indian texts, etc. That kind of a debate was going on in 1825. Wilkinson, Hall, Burgess, Weber, Kern, Thibault, they were all major scholars of editing and uh, translating Indian works in 19th century. By then, a trend started that uh, books started getting published with uh, uh, translations uh, the source works like Leelavati, Bijaganita, Grahalagava, etc. Indian publishers started publishing uh, these works with the translations sometimes in Bengali or Telugu or Marathi, etc. Soon enough, a set of scholars emerged who were often from the traditional learned families, but were educated in the English education system who started looking into our texts. Bapudeva Shastri is one of the oldest of them. He published the Siddhanta Shiromani, uh, then Lilavati. Bhavla discovered the manuscript of uh, Arya Bhatiya. Shankar Balakrishna Dikshit wrote a detailed history of Indian astronomy in Marathi, which has been translated into English later. Sudhankar Dvivedi was a very major scholar who brought to print about 40, 50 major texts of Indian mathematics and astronomy. In fact, much of our study today uh, owes to the fact that these books were published between 1860 and 1880 and 1900. I mean, the list is largely Lavati, Karana Kutuhala, Yantra Raja, Siddhanta Tattva Viveka, Shishyadhi Vradida, Bija Ganita, You can see that he was a major uh, scholar who edited and published sometimes with his own commentary uh, various books. And finally, his son in 1930s published the Ganita Kaumudi of Narayana Pandita also. Sudhakar Dvedi wrote a couple of books in Hindi also on history of Indian mathematics. So, this is a brief look at what happened between 1700 and 1900 about the study of our older tradition of mathematics by modern scholars. Now, let us go to development of modern education in India. So, this uh, universities of Calcutta, Bombay and Madras were set up in 1857. Uh, but most scholars who have studied this uh, understand that these were established mostly as examining bodies with lots of affiliated colleges on the model of the then London University and not on the model of the renowned Oxford or Cambridge universities, which were devoted to large amount of teaching and research activities. So, these were mostly degree awarding and uh, examining bodies that was what the universities were. So, looking at it, Mahendralal Sarkar in 1876 uh, started the Indian Association of Cultivation of Science with the hope that that will foster uh, research and advanced study amongst the Indians. But even then, nothing much perhaps happened in the first 20, 25 years of this institution. Most of the time, the main effort of the institution got uh, directed towards developing of science teaching in the college level. So, in 1855, there were about 15 colleges with uh, 3,246 students. By 1900, there were 150 colleges with 17,000 students and 45 professional colleges so, you can see that in a table like this, later on at leisure you can examine. This gives the growth of education actually, primary schools, special schools, etcetera. Some scholars in India started working on modern subjects. One person was Yesudas Ramachandra, a teacher of science in Delhi, who wrote a treatise on problems of maxima and minima. And he tried to approach these problems algebraically. D. Morgan, the British famous logician and mathematician got impressed with it, he got it republished in London. By the turn of 20th century, 
it was only by then that some serious research activity and uh, study of uh, higher sciences started in India. The Indian Mathematical Society began as analytical club in 1907 at the initiative of B. Ramaswamy Iyer. It started a journal in 1909, the Journal of Indian Mathematical Society. After 20, the 25th year of the uh, society, they started a popular journal for students. Some material was coming in Journal of Indian Mathematical Society itself, it was separated in the mathematics student was started. Soon enough, in good competition, the Calcutta Mathematical Society was started in 1908 by Professor Ashutosh Mukherjee at his initiative. It also began the bulletin of the Calcutta Society. We will discuss the development of modern mathematics in India from about 1905 uh, in the next lecture. Uh, I would like to go straight away to discuss the work of Srinivas Ramanujan, who uh, if we examining carefully, you will see that in some very fundamental sense, he is in continuity with the older tradition of mathematics uh, and science in India. So, the rest of this talk will be devoted to the work of Ramanujan. Uh, Ramanujan was born in December 1887. He enrolled in school in 1892 in Kumbakonam and he did fairly well in his school. He topped, he received a scholarship to study in the local college. Uh, and while at school, he looked at the Lonis trigonometry and he found that he had himself discovered many of these results. Towards late period in school, he looked up G. S. Carr's synopsis of pure and applied mathematics, which was a sort of a textbook for the Cambridge Wrangler examination, uh, listing about 5000 uh, formulae and results. Uh, this said to have influenced him considerably. He seems to have started discovering new results and recording them in his notebook uh, by the time, uh, by towards the later period when he was in school itself. Now, once he went to college, owing to his weakness in English, as Hardy notes, he totally failed, lost his scholarship, he came and joined Pachepa College in Chennai, but that also he could not. Uh, complete. He appeared for FA privately, failed. He got married in 1909. He continued his mathematical work and he went and met various influential people showing them the work and some of them uh, did help him and by the goodwill of his supporters, he at last obtained a job in Madras Port Trust as a clerk in 1912. He published about five papers during 1911 to 1913. The first paper was on properties of Bernoulli numbers. Uh, which is supposed to contain many interesting results. And he also sent about 30 problems to the Journal of Indian Mathematical Society. I am just giving one to show you the flavor, such kind of problems you have already seen in Narayana Pandita. So, one question he posed in 1911 was find the value of square root of 1 plus, square root of 1 plus, 3 times square root of 1 plus, etcetera. So, the square root runs over the entire. So, people were supposed to give the answer. If no answer came in 6 months, Ramanujan would give the solution, I mean the person who posed the problem. And so, the way Ramanujan solved it was, he first saw the simple identity, n to n plus 1 is n times this much and define n to n plus 1 as f n and immediately in terms of the f n, he was able to get by iteration a relation and so, the particular quantity here could be directly shown to be n to n plus 2, put n is equal to 1 and you get the beautiful result square root of 1 plus twice square root of 1 plus thrice square root of etcetera is equal to 3. Similarly, the other problem also. There is a paper called modular equations and approximations to pi, which was published after Ramanujan went to England in Quaternary Journal, but this is also said to be the kind of work that he was engaged in while in India. And uh, in 1985, this last series was used by Gosper to compute pi to 17 billion places, uh, which was a uh, record 17 million digits, which was a record at that time. And Borwein proved all the 17 series that Ramanujan had given in this paper for 1 by pi in 1989. And discovering similar series is continues to be a active area of mathematical research today. Okay. Continuing with Ram Ramanujan's story, in 1912, he sent a sample of his results to one professor M. J. M. Hill in the University College London uh, through the professor of Madras College of Engineering, which is the current Gindi College of. Professor Hill wrote back that Ramanujan has fallen into the pitfalls of divergent series and he should consult Bromwich's book on infinite series. 
Ramanujan again wrote to Baker and Hobson in Cambridge and did not, uh, it seems uh, he did not get any response. So, in January 1913, Ramanujan wrote to Godfrey Harald Hardy at Cambridge. <coughs> he enclosed uh, an 11 page uh, supplement which had more than 100 results. So, I am just displaying two of the results of Ramanujan. This is a continued traction, this is another continued traction and he has a certain relation between them and this is a continued traction and this is another analytical expression. These were two of the kind of 100 and 100 formulae that uh, Ramanujan sent to Hardy in January 1913. The impact of this letter can be gauged from the fact that on February 2nd, Lord Bertrand Russell wrote to Lady Morrell that he found Hardy and Littlewood in a state of wild excitement because they have discovered a second Newton, a Hindu clerk on 20 pounds a year. <laughs> so, in fact, even there is a comment of Littlewood to Hardy in March that looking at his work, I can believe that he is at least a Jacobi. Jacobi is a great uh, analyst of 19th century. So, Hardy wrote back to Ramanujan expressing interest in his work, but he added, but I want particularly to see the proofs of your assertions here. You will understand that in this theory, everything depends on rigorous exactitude of proof. And this is a point that Hardy repeated about two, three times in the same letter. <coughs> so, Ramanujan sends a reply back with another 10 page supplement with uh, various results. The main point he is trying to tell him is that you will not be able to follow my methods of proof if I indicate the lines on which I proceed in a single letter. That, of course, I follow a method. There is a method, there are various sorts of. Uh, our ways in which I am arriving at them, but it cannot be put down in a letter. Then he just threw a challenge, verify the results that I give and if they agree with your results, what by treading on the grounds in which the present day mathematicians move, you should at least grant that there may be some truths in my fundamental basis. So, it is one of the few letters by Ramanujan, he is asserting something about himself uh, that there is he has a method and he has an approach. And So, Ramanujan arrived in London on in April 1914. He left for India back in February 1919. Of these five years, he was very ill for more than two years, almost three years, I think. From around the spring of 1917, most of the time he spent in hospitals. On his work, uh, during the end of the year that he reached after six, seven months, he wrote to his friend B. Krishna Rao saying that I have changed my plan of publishing my results. I am not going to publish any of the old results in my notebook till the war is over. The war starts in 1914 and goes on till 1918. I am trying to get new results by their methods, so that I can easily publish these results without a delay. Same thing Ramanujan writes to another friend, Subramanian in a letter in 1915, that my notebook is lying in a corner, I am not going to take it out and publish any of the results. So, whatever work he did in England was with the, the new methods and the new ways and the, uh, with the interaction with the British mathematicians and of course, with his great acumen and intuition. <coughs> so, during 1914 to 1919, Ramanujan wrote about 30 papers, seven of them in collaboration with Hardy, which were mostly concerning properties of arithmetic functions. We will get a chance to have a glimpse of few of them. Work was highly acclaimed. In March, he was awarded BSc by research from Cambridge University for his paper on highly composite numbers. He was elected in FRS in 1918, the second Indian to be so honored. The earlier person was uh, a Parsi gentleman in mid 19th century. In October 1918, he was elected a fellow of Trinity College. Uh, they, it seemed that uh, they failed to elect him a fellow the previous year and that caused some heartburns for Ramanujan. So, in late 1918, Madras University offered him a, a, a matching grant of 250 pounds, the Cambridge Fellowship. Uh, gave him a 250 pound annual fellowship, the, being a fellow of Trinity College. So, Madras University also gave that. So, Ramanujan writes a very moving letter to the registrar saying that uh, after meeting his basic expenses, the surplus should be used for some educational purpose, such in particular as the reduction of school fees for poor boys and orphans and provision for books in schools. So, in March 1919, Ramanujan returns to India. He is in very poor health, stays a bit in Madras, then goes to Kodimudi. Kodumudi then goes to Kumbakonam, 
finally returns to Madras by January. At that time, he wrote to Hardy for the first time after returning to India. He returned in March 1990. I discovered very interesting functions recently, which I call mock theta functions. Unlike the false theta functions studied by Professor Rogers, they enter into mathematics as beautifully as the ordinary theta function. I am sending you with this letter some examples. Again, few pages of uh, results uh, enclosed. There is something called the last notebook of Ramanujan. This is a collection of more than 100 pages written, many of them written on both sides, having about 600 results. Uh, this was the, con this consists of the work that he was doing after he returned from England to India. These papers were sent to Hardy in 1923. It was finally discovered by George Andrews in 1976 in amongst Watson papers in Trinity College. So, Ramanujan passed away in April 1920. <coughs> now, soon after Ramanujan's death, uh, Hardy wrote an obituary and there he tried to give an estimate of Ramanujan, uh, what he thought of him when he came to England and what was made out of him later and how he understands his work. And uh, this is a very interesting document, it has to be read very carefully. Uh, I am just giving a few quotations. So, Hardy is saying that Ramanujan's idea as to what constituted mathematical proof were of the most shadowy description. All his results, new or old, right or wrong, had been arrived at by a process of mingled argument, intuition and induction. All this being written in the first obituary that uh, he is writing on <laughs> this man of which he was entirely unable to give any coherent account. There is another oft quoted statement of Hardy, which seems to make much of the statement that Ramanujan told him at some context that all religion seemed to him more or less to be equally true. Hardy took it to mean that he really did not believe in any religion and he says adhered, he Ramanujan adhered with a severity most unusual in an Indian resident in England to the religion's observance of his caste. But his religion was a matter of observance and not of intellectual conviction and the evidence for this is that I remember well his telling me much to my surprise that all religions seem to him more or less to be equally true. So, this is the kind of maturity that Hardy has in trying to understand this man. <laughs> so, then Hardy says of course that uh, Ramanujan was extraordinary in uh, his, within his insight in algebraic formulae, transformation of infinite series and so far so forth. On this side most certainly I have never met his equal and I can compare him only with Euler or Jacobi. But immediately he has to say he worked far more than the majority of modern mathematicians by induction from numerical examples, uh, but it was his memory, his patience and his power, not his mathematical acumen <laughs> that gave him all this uh, result. And he concludes the whole thing by saying Ramanujan did wonderful work but that cannot be called uh, a very great work or amongst the greatest works. It has not the simplicity and inevitability of the very greatest work. It would be greater if it were less strange. He would have probably been a greater mathematician if he had been caught and tamed a little in his youth. He would have discovered more that was new and that no doubt of greater importance. So, this was an assessment of Ramanujan's work given immediately after his death. And this was reprinted in the collected works of Ramanujan that Hardy, Sheshwayer and Wilson published in 1927. Again 15 years later Hardy had an occasion to write an estimate of Ramanujan. This was a series of lectures he delivered in Harvard and this came out as a book in 1940. Here Hardy is somewhat even more free in trying to explain how Ramanujan according to him was when he reached England. Ramanujan left a mass of unpublished work, he is referring to his notebooks, which has never been assessed properly until the last few years. This work includes a great deal that is new, but much more that is rediscovery and often imperfect rediscovery and it is sometimes still impossible to distinguish between what he must have rediscovered and what he may somehow have learnt. He is even sort of <laughs> accusing him of plagiarism that he has recorded some results without acknowledging <laughs> the source of it. And then he says, he had been carrying on an impossible handicap, a poor and solitary Hindu pitting his brains against the 
accumulated wisdom of Europe. Hardy was no ordinary racist or imperialist. He was after all a great anti-war champion. He was a liberal sort of intellectual. But even he, the times were such that even he could not resist coming up with this kind of a wonderful phrase, a poor and solitary Hindu pitting his brains against the accumulated wisdom of Europe. I should estimate that about two-thirds of Ramanujan's best work, Indian work was rediscovered. Anyway, so now let us go quickly to discuss something of Ramanujan's work. We will come back to the notebooks a little bit later, the work that he did prior to going to England which is contained in the notebooks, we will come to it towards the end of the talk. So, one of the important work of Ramanujan is, in, is on partitions. So, the number of partitions P of n is the number of distinct ways in which n can be written as a sum of positive integers without taking the order into account. So, it is not like the math number of uh, rows in the prastara of a matra vritta, where the order of the elements also is important. 2 plus 1 plus 1 will be treated differently than 1 plus 2 plus 1. GLL and LGL will be taken as two different partitions. So, these are repetitions not taken into account. So, the number of partitions of 4 are 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1, 1 plus 1 plus 2, 1 plus 3, 2 plus 2 and 4. So, there are 5 partitions of 4. If you try to write partitions of 10, you will immediately find that itself is a huge number. <coughs> in a couple of papers published in 1919 and 1920 and a published paper published posthumously in 1921, Ramanujan and discovered and proved these 3 very important congruences. What is meant by congruence? That is just that is divisible by That is what it means. So, in particular, P of 4, you saw this equal to 5. When I put m is equal to 0, you saw P of 4 was 5, that is divisible by 5. But Ramanujan is saying for any m, the number of partitions of P of 5 m plus 4 is divisible by 5, that is what this equation means. Similarly, the number of partitions of a number integer of the type 7 m plus 5 is divisible by 7. The number of partitions of a number of type 11 m plus 6 is divisible by 11. These were three congruence properties. He conjectured that uh, 5, 7 and 11 are the only primes for which such congruences hold that was proved about 70, 80 years later. In his 1919 paper, Ramanujan also wrote down a conjecture. This is somewhat complex. If d is an integer of 5 to the power a, 7 to the power b, 11 to the power c, and if lambda is a number such that 24 times lambda when divided by d gives a reminder of 1, that is what this equation means, then the partitions of lambda are divisible by d. This was the conjecture. He tried to, in an unpublished manuscript, Ramanujan tried to prove it for arbitrary a with b is equal to c is equal to 0. So, Chawla in 1934 disproved this conjecture. He showed that p of 243, you can see how big a number. The partitions of 243 are of the order of 10 to the power 14, it is a huge number. <coughs> he showed that uh, the 7 power relation is not fully satisfied and later on it has been shown that Ramanujan was essentially correct. In this congruence equation, you have to just change the b to a b prime uh, and b prime is either same as b if b is equal to 0, 1, 2 and b prime is of this form. In 1918, uh, Ramanujan and Hardy wrote a monumental paper which was hailed. It gave an infinite asymptotic series for p of n. That is, this is the dominant term for large n for p of n. So, p of n goes like e to the power minus root n by 1 by n. And for this, they use what is called the circle method. And later on, Bruce Burnt, who looked up Ramanujan's notebooks, found the elements of circle method in Ramanujan's notebooks and he says that it is unfortunate that it is called the Hardy Littlewood circle method because Hardy and Littlewood wrote many more papers on this afterwards. But more interesting was uh, the letter that Ramanujan wrote to Hardy, the first letter he wrote had a proposition like this, I mean again a very interesting kind of proposition. The coefficient of x to the power n in this complicated quantity 1 by 1 minus 2 x plus 2 x 4 etcetera is the integer nearest to 1 4 n cosine hyperbolic pi root n sin hyperbolic pi root n by. Okay. 
this was at the basis of uh, Ramanujan and Hardy's work on partition. In fact, Hardy acknowledged this city in 1940. But it is another matter that this in this Ramanujan had a much better result than what was proved in the Hardy Ramanujan paper. He had the exact form of the partition P of n, which was later on proved by Rademacher. I will come back to this question a bit later. <coughs> Now, another interesting thing of Ramanujan, which is often talked about is something called the tau function. This is the definition of the tau function. It is a function of integers n. So, it is left hand side is a power series like this, right hand side is an infinite product like this. Ramanujan uh, mentioned two properties of the tau functions. They were proved by Mordell in the next year. He wrote, defined the tau function in 1916. Ramanujan conjectured that if p is any prime, tau p is bounded by p to the power 11 by 2. This was a very famous conjecture. It was proved by Deline in 1974 as a consequence of proof of another very famous conjecture known as Weyl's conjecture for which Deline was awarded the Fields Medal and this year Deline has been given the Abel Prize, the, the current uh, sort of equivalent of Nobel Prize in mathematics. Now, anyway, uh, these are some of the kind of works that Ramanujan did, uh, the tau function, partition function, etcetera in his papers published from England. Now, during the time of Ramanujan centenary, an assessment started getting made of the kind of uh, impact his work had, what was the nature of his work. And Selberg is one of the leading number theorists of 20th century, uh, a Fields medalist in 1950. He was the first honorary recipient of Abel Prize in 2002. He explained how his work was very highly influenced by Ramanujan's work, how somebody, his father or someone gave him the collected work papers of Ramanujan and that sort of set him on a big trial, uh, trail of work. And according to Selberg, Ramanujan on his own had acquired an extraordinary skill of manipulation of algorithms, series, continued fractions and so forth, which certainly is completely unequaled in modern times. Then he says, in what has been left of his work, there seems quite clear evidence that he had developed on his own a theory of modular forms and equations. It is a very important area in mathematics. So, Ramanujan was essentially a modular forms man. And then Selberg comes to this question that this partition function P of n, uh, he says if one looks at Ramanujan's first letter to Hardy, there is a statement there which has some relation to his later work on partition function. It gives a leading term in what he claims as an approximate expression to the coefficient. If one looks at this expression, one sees that it is the exact analog of the leading term in Radmacher's formula for P of n. Radmacher's was the exact result, which was proved in 1930s. Selberg had independently proved the same result. Hardy and Ramanujan had given the asymptotic series, asymptotic form. <coughs> Ramanujan, in whatever way he had obtained this, had been led to the correct form of that expression. <laughs> and then he says that it was Hardy who seems to have. Uh, moved away from the conjecture Ramanujan made and proved a simpler result that he could prove. So, for technical reasons, he proved something much less. I think that if Hardy had trusted Ramanujan more, they should have inevitably ended with the Radmacher series. There is little doubt about it. Unfortunately, I mean he does not, uh, Selberg does not say so. Littlewood and Hardy were primarily working with hard analysis and they did not have a strong feeling for modular forms and such things. <laughs> Similarly, uh, Louis Mordell, another important uh, British mathematician, took the issue with Hardy comparing uh, Ramanujan with Euler and Jacobi. So, Selbeck tries to say that uh, uh, Mordell really has not seen Ramanujan's notebooks. And he says, uh, Mordell seems to go by the fact that a mathematician should be judged by the number of theorems that he has proved. So, <laughs> Selbeck says, I think that a felicitous but unproved conjecture may be of much more consequence for mathematics than the proof of many a respectable thing. I view this Felix Plain is credited to have said in the last century, in the 19th century <coughs> or early 20th century. And Selberg is saying that we are still studying this mock theta functions and things like that. So, really an assessment of Ramanujan's work cannot really be given. So, the final verdict is not really in and it may not be in for a long time, but the estimates of Ramanujan's texture in mathematics certainly have been growing over the years. There is no doubt about it. And then referring to the fact that Hardy said that Ramanujan's work could have been more greater if it were not that strange and if it were more mainstream, etcetera. 
He says, I do not think that Hardy fully understood how the interest for Ramanujan's work would be growing when he speaks of the influence which it is likely to have on the mathematics of the future. It seems rather clear that he underestimated that. Later developments have certainly shown him wrong on that point. Selberg is sort of a person well known for understatement, but definitive understatement. He will not make a hyperbole, but he makes his point very clearly. And he even had said that it would have been better if Ramanujan had gone to someone more sympathetic who had a more inclination in algebraic directions. For instance, E. H. K. in German. He was H. K. is well known for work on modular forms. So, by 1988, the assessment of Ramanujan's work uh, looks very, very different from the way it was assessed by Hardy in 1921. <coughs> now, how is it assessed today? So, next 5, 6 minutes here. The issue is the collected works of Ramanujan, which was published in 1927, had only 37 papers and then the 57 questions that he wrote in Mathematical Society and it included the two letters that he wrote to Hardy in 1913, which contained about 120 results, most of them taken from his notebooks without proofs. This uh, excluded almost the entire corpus of the work of Ramanujan that was done either before he went to England, the notebooks or the last notebook that he in which he wrote down the result after he came back from England. And the notebooks that were there had about 3300 results, the notebooks on which he wrote down his results prior to going to England and this last notebook had about 600 results. This entire corpus in fact has been seriously analyzed only in the last 25 years and so we are in a position to better estimate Ramanujan's work. So, as I said then itself Ramanujan started recording this in around 1904, sometime in 1911 or 13 he even made a copy of it. So, there are 351 pages, 16 chapters, uh, the second notebook has 21 chapters, 256 pages, third notebook has 33 pages, in all about 3254 results. Now, in 1921, uh, Professor Anand Rao of Presidency College wrote to Hardy. Hardy had inquired about uh, Ramanujan had mentioned about this mark theta functions in the letter in 1921 to Hardy. So, Hardy was inquiring whether there is some material on it. So, he says we will look it up and then he says now Madras University has passed a resolution. We are sending you all his notebooks uh, to be published. Anand Rao of course, adds uh, his own view that I fear it may look a little incongruous by the side of his mature work, mature work meaning the work that he did in collaboration with the British mathematicians in England, but still many people here in Madras seem to think that the notebooks may contain some valuable insights. So, these all these notebooks were sent in 1923 to England. Uh, I think some of them were returned to India through Ranganathan by Hardy. In 1927, the collected papers were edited, but the material of this notebook was not included in the collected papers. Now, when the collected papers got published, it had these two letters of Ramanujan, which had these 120 results. So, many people started looking at them and started proving them and wondering what else is contained in the notebook. So, there was a clamor for the publication of these notebooks. So, around 1930, Hardy asked Watson and Wilson to try and edit it. Somehow, this did not go through. Uh, Watson wrote about 30 papers on Ramanujan's work, but somehow they could not complete this. So, in 1957, uh, Tata Institute of Fundamental Research in Bombay published a, a facsimile edition, a photocopy of the book, but no editing was undertaken. A second edition of it has been published last year during the 125th year of Ramanuj. So, uh, Bruce Bunn says that it was only in 1974, he started looking at some results in the notebook and he found that there were many more that, uh, that he did not know and he started proving one or two of them. Then he realized that this is going to be a huge work. So, he spent the next 20 years from May 1977, he used all the material that Watson and Wilson had left, huge amount of notes had been made on Ramanujan's notebook, especially by Wilson uh, in wanting to edit that. And with the aid of all that, in about 5 volumes, uh, these notebooks were uh, with a commentary were published. So, now comes what Bruce Bunt understands after this is the notebooks that in which Ramanujan wrote down his results prior to going to England. Altogether, 
the notebooks contain over 3000 claims, almost all without proof. Hardy surmised that over two thirds of these results were rediscoveries. I mentioned that. This estimate is much too high. On the contrary, at least two thirds of Ramanujan's claims were new at the time that he wrote them, that is between 1904 to 1913. And two thirds more likely should be replaced by a larger fraction. Almost all the results are correct, perhaps no more than 5 to 10 are incorrect in a mass of 3250 results. And then he describes what were the topics that contain. This is an article written in the context of the 125th year of Ramanujan. Now, there is this other last notebook of Ramanujan, which was discovered in 1976 by George Andrews. Uh, it has about 600 results, and uh, this uh, facsimile of this notebook was published during Ramanujan's centenary uh, by Narosa publishers. Now, Andrews and Bunt have embarked on an edition of this material in five volumes. Three volumes have appeared now, <coughs> and again they list the kind of works. Mark theta functions is only a small part of this uh, last notebook, there are only 5 percent, there are many more things it contains. So, this work is still going on. Now, on mark theta functions itself, since so much is talked about, what is a mark theta function? So, this last letter to Hardy had 17 examples of functions like this, each of them is a mark theta function and Ramanujan gave this formula for this function, which was proved in 1966 by Andrews. In 1935, G. N. Watson had said that uh, uh, Ramanujan's discovery of mark theta functions makes it obvious that his skill and ingenuity did not desert him at the oncoming of his untimely end. As such, as any of his earlier work, the mark theta functions are an achievement sufficient to cause his name to be held in lasting remembrance. In uh, during his centenary, Freeman J. Dyson, a very famous theoretical physicist, said that uh, I, uh, some new theory is expected out of this mark theta functions. In the recently last month, I think there is a paper by a famous Japanese scholar Ken Ono on Ramanujan's mark theta functions. In his famous deathbed letter, this is the abstract of that paper, Ramanujan introduced the notion of a mark theta function and he offered some alleged examples. Recent work by Zweigerts in 2001 and 2 has elucidated the theory in composing this. They are holomorphic parts of special harmonic weak mass forms. This is not the misspelling, these are a special mathematical terminology. Despite this understanding, little attention has been given to Ramanujan's original definition of Mach theta functions. Here, that is in this paper of 2013, we are proving that Ramanujan's examples do indeed satisfy his original definition. So, this is the kind of uh, sort of scenario we are now in uh, regarding Ramanujan's work. Now, what has been the sort of uh, cause of uh, tremendous uh, confusion in uh, trying to understand and almost made Ramanujan an enigma is the issue that uh, uh, everybody is asking Ramanujan has this result, but where are the proofs? In fact, this started in 1913 itself with Hardy telling Ramanujan, your results are fine, but unless you send me the proofs, <laughs> what is the use? <laughs> and uh, the published work in India and his notebooks have some proofs here and there, but uh, most of them are sketchy, not rigorous, incomplete, sometimes even said to be faulty. Now, Ramanujan himself had no doubts whatsoever about the validity of his results. And as he wrote to his friends that he was even willing to wait and supply proofs in the necessary format, so that they can be published. But all the time, he was more furiously engaged in discovering newer and newer results. There is one very interesting story documented in a paper by Schiltz uh, of a conversation he had with Littlewood. Littlewood was a colleague of Hardy in Cambridge at that time. Professor Littlewood once told me, that is Edward Schiltz, that he had been assigned by Hardy to the task of bringing Ramanujan up to date in the more rigorous methods of European mathematics, which had emerged subsequently to the state reached by Ramanujan's studies in India. He said that it was extremely difficult, because every time some matter, which it was thought Ramanujan needed to know was mentioned, Ramanujan's response was an avalanche of original ideas, which made it almost impossible for Littlewood to persist in his uh, original intention. Okay, so, much of this cause of uh, difficulty and confusion is with the fact that the the Greco-Western tradition of mathematics almost equates all mathematics with proof. 
and so the process of discovery of mathematical results can only discuss uh, understood very vaguely it can be described as intuition natural genius if you see the writings of hardy you will find that he is a man who doesn't know any proof but he is filled with intuition he is filled with natural genius so since mathematical truths are believed to be non empirical there is no systematic way of arriving them except by pure logical reason so this is the sort of dominant understanding of mathematics uh, which uh, does not uh, uh, throw any light on mathematical discovery and for the same reason it cannot explain most of the history of mathematics so or not even the contemporary mathematical practice as to how one comes up with a result or how somebody else uh, correct some result and things like that <laughs> incidentally hardy was one of those people who really swore by the non empirical nature of mathematics this quotation was given yesterday it is the second half of that quotation which is more interesting the greeks were the first mathematicians who are still real to us today oriental mathematics may be an interesting curiosity but greek mathematics is the real thing this is his view of uh, oriental mathematics that's all right so greek mathematics is permanent hardy you understand is a great agnostic great skeptic uh, so greek mathematics is permanent immortality may be a silly word but probably a mathematician has the best chance of whatever it may mean so it is mathematical truths that are going to uh, stay forever and forever and forever on the contrary in the indian tradition at least as known from the text of the last 2 3000 years mathematics was not equated with proof mathematical results were not perceived as being non empirical and they could be validated in diverse ways in this way the process of discovery and the process of validation were not completely diverged from each other of course we have to understand it much more if we have to make a claim like that proof or logical argumentation to demonstrate the results was important but they were mainly for obtaining the community's assent for one's result and therefore if we have to conclude something we can go back to this wonderful quote of joke of bertrand russell that hardy and ritwood had discovered a second newton in a hindu clock but the kind of outline i have given to you of ramanujan's work and the kind of outline of the earlier work of kerala school will perhaps does convince you that it's not merely in terms of his methodology or philosophy that ramanujan is clearly in continuity with the indian tradition of mathematics even in his extraordinary felicity in handling iterations algorithms infinite series continued fractions transformations of them etc he is a successor of madhava the founder of kerala school so this is the collected papers these are the lectures by hardy uh, then these are the two uh, the notebooks of ramanujan edited by bruce bunt in five volumes from 85 to 98 these are his letters edited by bunt the well known biography of robert kanigal which is i think being reprinted last year bunt and rankin have a set of collected essays this uh, last notebook is still coming three volumes of it have appeared so far this was a recent collection of articles during the time of ramanujan's 125th year thank you